We've got a lot to get through and quite a lot of gambling review action to get through beyond this. So, Neil Channing, you're in the producer's bad books already. Oh, shocking. All right, we're going to have to stick to time here. Right, classic trials. Were they classic trials or were they simply a series of races that may or may not have any bearing on the guineas, Neil Channing? Well, they were nice races, weren't they? I mean, and, and definitely they're interesting in the, their trials. They're not the finished article. Horses are going to improve. Uh, gelding, like Dom, gelding's all over the shop as well, didn't they? Yeah, we? a bit of that. But, you know, you, you said, Dominic, about the, the filly that came second. And Dance she's got, Yeah, she's gone from being favourite to not quite favourite in the guineas now. Uh, that was definitely a trial. She's going to improve. She, she, she didn't run a bad race. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I just feel like trials have really gone out of fashion, though. I mean, it used to be the Craven was the big thing, wasn't it? People often talk about, oh, you know, the start of the flat should be the Craven, or but gamblers often say, well, I don't really bet on the flat until the Craven. It, it kind of feels like the Craven that's not even really got going yet. Question on that one, then, Dom. Is it, actually, is it easier to get a horse ready for a race like the Guineas now than it was 30 years ago at home, or not? Or has nothing changed? Nothing's really changed, but... A lot of trainers use, do race course gallops and they, they, you know, they have cohorts of good horses so they'll take them to the race course and they'll have a race course, course gallop. In the old days, we'd... You'd run them. We'd run them. Uh, what's your view on that? So we saw like, a whole load of horses galloping before racing and you're thinking, God, these races would be more fun if they were in the races rather than galloping early. I agree. I mean, I've always been, you know, it's an entertainment business. We should be running our good horses. And we don't run them as often, perhaps, as we should do. Do you think also, like, the, the crowd looked sparse? I well, thought, if you, you weren't market. there. I wasn't it was there. Baltic. I was watching on TV. It was horrible. Yeah. So, I mean, do you think this is a... Surely this is a factor, you know, that the, these races are not quite as competitive as they used to but be. But even if they'd been bang up to standard, well, you'd have be been better off sitting in the, wind, in the warmth, wouldn't Well, it is a bit windy. I thought, I, thought though, like, I thought Roger Varian's filly looked good out of Narain that finished place yesterday. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's one once race maiden win is going to improve. And, you know, as in, there'll, there'll be plenty of good horses come yeah. out of it. The good old, the good old for horse yesterday, the Duval, we had a secret gesture oh, yeah. that looked a proper horse. Yeah, pretty, pretty good. Um, Cheltenham changes. Right, Ian Renton has suggested this week to the Racing Post and then to me later in the week that it was inevitable that there would be changes to the race programme at the Cheltenham Festival, though there would still be four days and it would still be 28 races. So if you're going to get rid of something, you've got to replace it with something. And if you change the conditions of something, then something has to make way. Um, how would you go about it? If you've got 28 races, four days, what would you lose, add, tinker with, change? What would I lose? Um... Bear in mind, if you've got to lose something, you've got to put something in its place. Well, I mean, uh, I would probably lose the mayor's novice hurdle. I mean, I, I would. I think mayor's race works really out well important. this year, hasn't it? it, 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 ha it has, yeah. Days ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's true. I mean, if it was me, like if I if I was if I was king for a day, I, I would I would go back to six races, keep it four days, and I would scrap four, you know, and try and bring people together and make the product more competitive and more compelling. I think we're selling the sport short and watering it down too. So much. they're saying that the, their, their focus groups are saying that the punters won seven, seven a day. So within those parameters, Dom, what do you do? Lose the mayor's hurdle because there's always, you know, there's always a short price favourite in it, and they should be in the champion hurdle. Oh, so the, what? The mayor's two and a half mile hurdle, the no. conditions hurdle. Yeah. Yeah, the one that lost him up yeah. won this yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. So you'd get rid of that. But then, what would you, so would. If, they, if you've still got to have the 28 races, what do you put in its place? Do we, have, do we have to keep that number of races? Well, they, they say that's what their customers yeah. want and they're going to definitely stick by it. I mean, the easiest thing they can do without having to bring in a new race is change the, the, the uh, cross-country to, uh, to a handicap. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that gets more runners potentially it, in the Gold Cup. It sounds and, as though and the, and the novice chases is where they're going to concentrate. So that, I, think, I think, first of all, they've got to do that cross-country change because it's easy yeah. and it doesn't involve bringing in an extra race. Uh, I think if they get rid of the turners, which I think... Make it back a into a handicap. Novice handicap chase. Make it back I mean, into a novice. Yeah, they'll come, come back with that Aplutard novice yeah. handicap chase that everybody liked. And actually, the meeting probably needs more handicaps. I, th I think one change that they could do, which doesn't necessarily... Uh, it's not changing the, the number of races or which races they are, but they could swap them around a little bit. Like, it's clear that Wednesday is a less popular day. The numbers on Wednesday were particularly down compared with the other days. And I think a lot of people, when you're reading previews of the day, people are like, yeah, don't bet in bumpers, not interested in that, be rushing off before that. A lot of people say, oh, I don't like the cross-country. So having them both on the same having day. Having them both on the same day seems a bit crazy. You could, you could knock out one of them, put it on the Thursday, 
and get, get an extra handicap yeah. in on the, on the Wednesday. But the point is this, if they're going to stay at 28 races, which they insist on doing, then if you're saying stuff like, well, get rid of the old National Hunt chase, you, what are you going to put in its place? Or are you going to change the conditions back, be bold, be brave, make it more interesting? More handicaps, more handicaps. More handicaps, says Neil Channing. Mayors are getting, getting a bum steer from the two men on my right as well. Um, cocaine at Aintree, well, this is... A, a, a rehash, for want of a better word, of, of old stories, isn't it, Neil? I mean, every time... I don't know why you a... suddenly thought you should come to me on Class A drugs. I mean... Well, uh... I'll go to Dominic French. <laughs> it's on Class A drugs. It's there, You're going to take it personally? Dom, has, uh, has the sport got any more of a recreational drugs problem within its crowd than any other sector of society, I suppose? And was it a reasonable uh, expose from The Telegraph to go around swabbing all the loser at Aintree and saying... Look at this, it's all rife with cocaine. I, I don't think that our sport has any more of a higher level than, than in any other section of the society. Um, you know, when I was a child or growing up, we, we didn't really know about cocaine, and, and it was for the rich superstars and, and pop stars and things that we'd heard about. It. Now the local pl plumber might be dabbling in it uh, you know, at the weekend. Let me um, tell you, plumbers which, are some of the richest people in our society. Well, exactly, <laughs> well, quite possibly so. Um, and, you know, you swab loos all around the country and you'll find it. It's, it's a major problem. Um, I, I don't think it's exclusive to racing or... Do you think a lot of it's to do with the alcohol culture, though, at racing? That, that racing is being promoted as a place where you go to get tanked up to an extent. A lot of people think of it as a day where, you know, like, you, you know when you say people go to the airport and they, they post a selfie of themselves seven in the morning... 5am with a couple of pints yeah. of Stella, yeah. But it's kind of like that at the races. You know, you go to Cheltenham or you go to Angie, you turn up, it's, you know, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, we're having the first one. There'll now. also be a lot 100%. of people getting the train to Wembley today having a having beer a few on the beers way down. On the train. Yeah, like, sure. I, I think this is a, it's just not a society problem. Yeah. And again, racing's kind of or the Telegraph using it to mm. beat racing with. I, I think you go anywhere and this is the same problem. So. But it's definitely a thing that racing needs to be a bit wary of. I think people... It, it does put people off going. I mean, maybe... Uh, at Cheltenham, you know, going back to Cheltenham, I know we, it says Aintree on the caption, but, I, you know, people say, oh, there's nowhere to sit down. You can't just go and have a normal chat. A lot of the places, it's thudding music and people really getting tanked up. Well, there's no I point mean, being sniffy about it. It's like that everywhere, isn't it? <laughs> no, I'm not, so, I'm not yeah, saying I mean, that. And I won't. Yeah. I but, yeah, but we have, in, in the UK generally, we've become a real coffee shop culture. You know, every high street has, you know, loads of big brand coffee shops. I don't think there's enough places to just sit and have a cup of tea or a coffee at the race. No, I, I would agree with you. I got taken to Henley a couple of years ago. I've got no interest in rowing. Mm. Didn't see a boat all day. Can't remember much about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the cocaine, isn't it? <laughs> that's a talking <laughs> point. <laughs> that, that's, what, that, that's one vice that has escaped. <laughs> um, the Grand National narrative this week has um, followed an interesting arc, Charlie, really, hasn't it? So, race happens, no fatalities, different kind of race, lots of finishes. Everyone says, this is a great triumph. Middle of the week, bit of a backlash starts to come. Richie Forrestal says, time to stop the backslapping culture. Chris Cook says, uh, I'm mourning the loss of the race I knew, for all I understand the changes that have taken place. And then you look at the letters page in the Racing Post today and opinions are more di sharply divided. There's a, an element of the Waldorf and Statler. It was great, it was great, or was it that great? Oh, no, it was terrible kind of uh, um, arc to this. Where are you? I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, isn't it? You know, as in... You're not allowed to say that. I, 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 mean, <laughs> I, I, gen, I mean, I've I got plenty of opinions, but, but with this, I, I'm a bit lukewarm. You know, I thought the world has changed, the race has to change if we want to maintain it. I thought it was a really good race, first and foremost. Uh, you, there was, there's got to be something to enjoy about 20 top-class racehorses in with a chance for a million-pound race. Um, but then all the stuff about championing no fatalities, a bit like, oh, come on, like... This is a really dangerous narrative because, unfortunately, with, with a risk sport, we know somewhere in the future that's not going to happen, isn't it? You know? And mm. I don't know what your defence is then. Well, I think the key is that you can say the race is going to evolve and change and always going to be looked at, that changes that are made are not as a direct result exactly. of what has happened the previous year. 
the, the, the sport is just evolving. So you have to be ahead of rather than behind the curve. Yeah, we're on the front foot. Like, race, I think we are. I think Aintree uh, there's, 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 there's a penalty for saying front foot now, on, I think. On, is there? On, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that seat automatically that... Expl explodes <laughs> if you say the sport's oh, no, on the front foot. Flip yeah. Over backwards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I think they are doing a good job and, and maintaining and looking at welfare, making sure it is a very much big factor. But I think just making everything, na the narrative about fatalities is... But when people talk about the jeopardy, I, I, don't, I don't personally really enjoy that, the idea that I've got my heart in my mouth, something might fall and die in a minute like that. Well, no, no, no. There's a, difference, there's a difference between saying something might fall and die in a minute than saying there is an inherently greater element of... Uh, jeopardy in, in here than it's well, not about... That, would that race have been better with a bit more chaos? I don't think so. I mean, bearing in mind, of course, we are just talking a sample size of one. It may be that next year we have exactly the same new conditions and there are a whole load of fallers. I mean, those yeah. horses, there's 150... They'd run 155 races this year, one fall, that mob that ran last week. So... On, onwards. <clears throat> but there is going to be a BHA rule change. It's not official yet. It is in the offing, however, that in, in order to get into harmony with the rest of the world, if an incident happened, for example, like last year's Dash at Epsom, where four, four stalls opened early and four horses had a material uh, advantage, or, four, was it, or was it late? No, four, four stalls opened yeah, late yeah. and they had a material disadvantage. They could now, under the new rule, be deemed non-runners. Punter, do you like it or not? I, I, I mean, as long as there's consistency and it's easy to enforce and everybody knows what's going to happen and it's communicated well, it's got to be a good thing. Mm. And, and it's, it's what happens. You're nodding away there, Charlie. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you've got to look after the punter. I mean, surely, like, they, are, they underpin the sport and it, it, it's a great passion for many. If, you, if you're backing in the dash and your stall opens half a second or a millisecond later than the rivals, you're not getting a fair crack at it, are you? So that, to me, is a but really from, sensible decision. From an owner's point of view, how, how is it going to work? You know, if the horse m misses the break because it's opened a bit late, but still runs into prize money, and it's a non... How can they deem it a non-runner? Well, interestingly, it was one of the owners, wasn't it? Steve DeLimos, who ended up having the, the Nunthorpe winner. One of his horses ran in the, in the dash and was favourite yeah. and got a disadvantage. He was, he was at the BHA quite hard, and I think... I think certainly Brant Dunshay and others within the BHA are quite sympathetic to, to him and, and a lot of punters and to get into, into line with the rest of the world. Yeah. So You're not it's so a sure. Difficult, I'm not so sure about it. It's, it's going to be difficult to implement, I think. And, and, and you know, how, as I say, you know, if the horse is materially disadvantaged by missing the break and then runs into second place and picks up good prize money, does he still get the prize money even though he's a non-runner? Mm. It's it's an it's food for thought, Charlie. That is indeed it's a it's a, it's an interesting counter argument. I completely agree with you, um, but I think, like I said, but you have to look after punters. I think it's very important. Neil, it's tricky. It's tricky. I mean, I I, I saw that race at Wolverhampton uh, recently, mm. where they had a nine non-runners or yeah. something, however many. Uh, you know, as a punter, I actually backed the horse in the in the dash where the owner complained and. Uh, I just kind of, I wasn't, like, obviously I wasn't happy, I did my money, but I just kind of felt like, well, it's just like having a faller or a horse whip round at the start, it's just one of those things in, in gambling. I, it wasn't something that troubled me that much. Okay, on we go. Let's talk about, has anyone seen the new RSPCA advert? This is bad, isn't it? How can we have this as a talking point? I didn't even know about it. I haven't seen it, sorry. Well, I'm going to, I'll, I'll describe well, you it. You talk for I? two minutes. Right, it's, it's to the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the tune of respect, Aretha Franklin. Oh, nice. All I need is a little respect. Nothing the, the, wrong with that. The voices of all the different animals coming out just show me a little respect. That's the theme. It's very brilliantly done by a very, very clever agency. Mm. Um, within it is a scene of a greyhound race where the clear inference that you're meant to draw is that you are not showing greyhounds respect when they're racing and that you are, given the way that the words of the Ugh. song... I'm not, I'm, I'm not best you are when someone's stroking the dog's head, OK? It's within this, within mm. this advert, there's also somebody stopping while they're mowing mm. the lawn to make sure they don't run over a bee. Mm. Well, if you've ever been, managed to stop your lawnmower before you've run over a bee, good luck. Mm. And also stopping short of swatting an insect climbing up the wall. There's also then images of cows being milked, 
clearly there's, there, that, that is then put on the same level as, as a large um, station of battery hens. So I'm just asking you, as a fan of a sport where animals are out there doing their thing every day, how comfortable you feel with that and with where horse racing's relationship now is with our leading um, animal welfare, and I use that word advisedly, charity, and to what extent they might be now becoming an animal rights organisation. Well, they're a dodgy charity anyway, aren't they? I mean, they spend more money on suing people than they do on, you know, protecting animals. They're, they're you know, they're constantly on the, on the ear of for people to leave money to them and their wills. One of the richest charities in the country, they, they don't really, they're not a, a charity that, they're not like a sort of a rehoming of racehorses or something where they're getting their hands on animals and looking after them. They're more of a lobbying organisation. They spend a lot of money on legal stuff, um, huge salaries. I, the, the RSPCA is a, is, a, is, a, is a monolith, isn't it? But, well, that, be, be that as it may, it's an incredibly powerful. But it's well. weird, isn't it? You know, we're, Chris, we're a sport Chris, Chris, that pa I think... Chris Packham, who has a huge yeah. following, is yeah. narrating the advert. That in itself yeah. will yeah. be quite inflammatory to certain people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he is someone who's put his sig signature before mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to um, letters, for example, to bring an end to the Grand National, for yeah, example. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm just asking where, how, how carefully racing should be thinking about stuff like this when they see adverts like that. Um, they've got to think incredibly carefully. You know, as in, um, like you say, whether the, I completely agree with everything Neil's saying, but whether we agree with that or, or not, the vast majority of the public don't see the RSPCA that way. No, so. they see them. So they, I would exactly. imagine, they're, reputationally, they're extremely strong. Yeah, massively. Yeah. And so, therefore... And do some great work. They, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the, the BHA have to think very carefully about maintaining that relationship and how they move forward with that. Um, but it's a bit sick, isn't it, that we're a sport that, you know... I, I, I nearly said front foot then, has done a good Can't job... Can't say front has, foot. ...has done Maybe a good Silver. job of, um, uh, of, you know, being on, uh, being on the side of animal welfare mm. generally. Uh, I think there have been... You know, I like the changes to the Grand National. I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I think the world is moving got to, on. Got to, got to move you on now. OK, but... Uh, I, I don't, I, there's lots no, you, you want to talk about. Oh, we've we run out of two minutes. I, we've only got a few minutes. I, I made a couple of notes on oh, this one. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I hate it. When OK. I I was only, Smoke, uh, right, the smoking, the smoking ban. OK. I, it's only because of the number of MPs. Uh, think, back to think back to September. Yeah. Um, so... The, 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 what do you what do you know about uh, your, you? You were talking about drugs before. Nitrous oxide, laughing got, gas. Yeah, it got yeah. changed into a Class C drug. Mm. They had done a 2023 advisory council on the misuse of drugs. Had spent an absolute fortune and come up with the idea that overall it doesn't really cause you much harm and uh, it doesn't really no. merit any control. Well, so I and took suddenly, that was in the delivery suddenly, suite. And suddenly the government said, well, we need to vote against it, make it into a Class C drug. Uh, 404 to 36 MPs voted in favour of that, and it's now a Class C drug. So smoking came up this week, uh, 383 to 67. It was a free vote for the Tories. Uh, and 57 of the 67 that voted... Uh, basically, if you, if you were born after 2012, uh, you, you won't be able, ever allowed to legally buy cigarettes. So effectively, and that will, you know, each year that will go forward. So effectively smoking will be banned in this country. Um, now, whether you think that's good or whether you think that's bad, um, there's, there's not really the subject. The, the, the 57 Tories um, said, no, libertarianism, we're, we're conservative MPs, we think people should be allowed to make their own... So where are these up. great libertarians Exactly. The well, this debate, is then? the exact reason that it appears on the talking points, because, of course... The question is, well, if they think that way about smoking, you know, where's the consistency? How can they be allowing affordability checks to come in and tell people what they can spend their money on in terms of gambling when smoking every cigarette you smoke is detrimental to your health? For most people that gamble, it's, it's a positive in their life. Mm. So there you are. And that will lead us neatly on to the next and oh, final The last segment. thing I'll say very quickly, I did speak to someone at the BHA and they said they've written to each of the 57 Tory MPs good. and pointed good. out That's this good. this contradiction in the way they're thinking, which I thought was quite mm. well, quite front foot by the BHA. Yes, well done. Well done on the, on the front foot. Um, we're firmly on the back foot time-wise. Those were this week's talking points.